number 7881. Good evening, I'm Rick Roberts. If you've been in the hospital or visited the doctor's office recently, you know the cost of getting sick is expensive. Back in April, Governor Ray put together an 11-member commission to find ways to hold down rising health care costs. The governor noted that the average cost of a hospital bed went from $118 a day in 1976 to $179 a day in 1980, an increase of 50%. He says the commission will study the rising costs and make suggestions as to what the state can do to bring them in line. Valid statistical information on which good judgment can be formed and decisions can be made. Uh, along with that, as you've noted, I'm sure uh, we've asked them for what recommendations they might have. The commission is examining such things as the high use of hospitals, how government regulations affect costs, the availability of health care professionals, and the health of poor persons. The commission is working with a budget of $300,000, $80,000 coming from the state, and the rest from private industry. D. Eugene Syberry, president of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Iowa, is a member of the Governor's Commission. We talked with Syberry about rising health care costs and some possible solutions. Health care costs in Iowa continue to escalate as they have elsewhere in the country. Um, we certainly are seeing an increase in the hospital per diems, the cost for a patient day in the hospital, in uh, doctor, dental, other type professional services. Uh, the increase in Iowa has not been as remarkable as elsewhere in the country, but it still has been on the uh, incline and uh, uh, upward, and we uh, are concerned about it as most people are. Has it been uh, rising faster than the rate of inflation? Is there something else in there that's making it go up higher? Yes, actually in Iowa we have a problem of high utilization, which is uh, unique uh, to Iowa in comparison elsewhere to, in the country. Uh, we are the fourth highest state in terms of in-hospital inpatient utilization. Uh, this uh, means that even though on the average when you go to an I Iowa hospital you get a real bargain because the per unit or the per day costs are lower than the national average, when we buy so many units of care, it means that our overall health care costs are higher than elsewhere in the country, and that makes it a very pronounced problem. We're trying to do something about it, but it is the high utilization that primarily is the problem in Iowa. The governor has a commission looking into what can be done with the rising health care costs. Do you see government playing a very big role, the state government playing a very big role in trying to contain those costs? Well, I think there has to be a, a partnership between the private and public sectors. I think in recent years, government may have been playing a more active role and a larger role than might be necessary. Uh, yes, I think that the governor's commission is evidence that uh, the governments, the governmental sector and the private sectors can work together. That is a private nonprofit corporation appointed by the governor to look at health care issues in the state of Iowa. I don't think the private sector can do it alone. I don't think the public sector can do it alone. I think it does require a true partnership. There must be some regulation to bring about necessary results. And I hope that by initiatives within the private sector, uh, we can keep the governmental role to a minimum. You talk about high utilization of hospital services in Iowa. Are we sicker or are we in the hospital maybe more or longer than we need to be? We aren't in the hospital longer than we need to be. Uh, the average stay in Iowa is below the national average. Our admission rate is much higher than the national average. 1980 data would indicate that uh, Iowans go to the hospital for those under age 65, which is for comparative purposes the best group, 
to compare because of age differences, but when you take that group of under age 65, Iowans are admitted approximately 40% more often than elsewhere in the country, on the average. Do we know why? We don't know why, and that in part is why the Governor's Commission on Health Care was formed. It is also why Blue Cross of Iowa started mandating private utilization review working through the Iowa Foundation for Medical Care on all admissions to the hospitals occurring after January 1 of 1981. Frankly, I think there's a good environment in which to live in Iowa. I do not think Iowans are sicker than elsewhere. I think several factors contribute to this. One, insurance mechanisms or prepayment such as Blue Cross have been guilty because we have emphasized in-hospital benefits rather than paying for care on an ambulatory basis. We're doing something about that now. Also, I think the way medicine is practiced in Iowa. They're much more conservative in Iowa in comparison to the East Coast or the West Coast, and physicians admit many patients for inpatient surgical procedures that in other parts of the country are being done routinely on an ambulatory basis. While efforts are being made to determine why health care costs are rising and what can be done about it, we all can take steps to reduce the cost of our own health care. One example of this is the so-called wellness program. Instead of waiting until we're sick to be concerned about our health, we could take steps to reduce the likelihood of illness. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Iowa initiated a wellness program for its employees a few years ago and is now helping other corporations do the same. Dr. Wayne Severson, Vice President of Medical Affairs for Blue Cross Blue Shield, is in charge of the wellness program. Basically what we want to do is screen every employee of ours, detecting high risk factors that may affect their life in the future or at present. Now there are many silent things going on in our bodies that we're not aware of. Now we should of course be aware of those alarm systems that are built up in our body that says something is going wrong. There's pain, there's distress, there's something where we don't feel well. And let's take care of that problem right now by saying be aware of that alarm system in our body. It's very delicate and it's there to tell us that something is wrong. Don't be one of these persons who say nothing can happen to me. I'm okay. I'll never die. Nothing will ever happen to me. So let's take care of that problem by saying, go to your physician if you have warning signs of illness. Okay. Now let's go to the well person who says he's well, feels he's well, and probably is well. But there are many things that can be going on in his body that is not well. And we can detect those with, with many different methods. And when we do so, then we can direct that person to become involved in improving his health. Now we do many other things too. The second uh, most important thing, I think, is the risk factors. And we have various risk factors involved in being able to predict what may happen to us. Now, one of the risk factors is your genetics. What does your bloodline die of? Now, if your father and uncles died early of a heart attack or of a stroke, that puts you on notice that you have a problem and you need to do whatever you can do in helping your body prevent arteriosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. Uh, we uh, then evaluate the risk factors, and there's about 10 different risk factors. It involves age and gender, what your parents died of, whether you have diabetes, what your lifestyle is like, how much exercise you get, whether you smoke, very important, what your blood cholesterols are. All of these are factors that we measure for every employee. And we say, you're a high risk factor because you've got too many positives in these areas. And then we do something about that. Or we say, you're a low risk factor, you're lucky. You know, your father and mother and grandmother and great grandmother uh, died when they were 90 years old of uh, natural causes. And, and that doesn't mean they can discontinue thinking about their health, but at least they're in good grounds. If you're a high risk, I would like these three things. I'd like you to keep trim, keep fit, and keep happy. Because stress is a very important part of how it affects the target organs of our blood vessels. Sometimes we take life too seriously. 
We all have stress, and that's a normal part of living. But if we have stress that's every day and every day, and it's unfulfilled, it's like a full court press in life all the time. And that can do nothing but cause disease in us. Exercise, very important thing to do. We live in a sedentary life. We sit behind desks like I do, and our cholesterol goes up, our blood pressures go up, and exercise certainly impacts that significantly. What we eat and how much we eat also has a lot to do with how we feel. We went to ISU Extension Nutritionist Betsy Schaefer to find out if Americans are becoming more aware of proper nutrition. Some of us are very concerned about what we eat and many, many Americans are changing their diets for health reasons. Other people just couldn't care less. <laughs> All of the nutrition advice that we give is based on two principles, variety and moderation. And if all of your food selections follow those two principles, you will have a healthful diet. We name four different food groups, and if you're eating foods from all of those groups, you are getting a varied diet, and that is helpful. What are those groups now? Refresh Let's see. Our uh, fruits and vegetables is one group. The second group is breads and cereals. A third group is milk and milk products. This would include cheese, yogurt, all kinds of things made with milk. And the fourth group is meat and other protein-rich foods, such as poultry, beans, eggs. What about food attitudes? We've heard a lot about the pros and cons of food attitudes lately. Uh, what should we watch out for? We would not have the foods that we're used to if we did not have additives in them. Most of the additives are there to add nutritive value. Many vitamins are added to foods, and these are food additives. Also, many of the additives are preservatives. Now, all of these are reviewed constantly by the Food and Drug Administration to guarantee their safety. Uh, if some are ever found to be unsafe, they are immediately removed from the marketplace. Another hot topic is salt in our diet. Apparently we're consuming much too much salt. We certainly are. Ten times more salt than we actually need. It is an essential nutrient, sodium is, but not in the quantities that we're used to consuming. And we can easily cut that down. Processed foods are very rich in sodium, and we can use fresh foods more often, prepare foods from scratch. We can stop adding salt ourselves at the table to foods. Are there some foods that contain a lot of salt that might surprise us that we might not be aware of? Oh, I'm sure there are. Ketchup is full of salt, cheese, uh, hot dogs, all processed foods, canned soups are very high in salt. We'll have more about feeling good in just a moment. Joining us now is Michael Pasak from Iowa State University, and his area of expertise is health education. Michael, how do you regard the whole area of wellness programs? Well, wellness is very important. Wellness is a relatively new phenomena. Uh, wellness, wellness is health promotion. It's an effort that uh, provides an opportunity for individuals to make decisions concerning their health. 
Wellness is considered in many ways the opposite of the sickness system that uh, doctors are working in. Um, as has been said already, it deals with risk factors, it deals with preventing disease, it deals with well people. It's uh, an effort that tries to get people to take self-responsibility uh, of their lives, their lifestyles, changing behaviors, uh, and making healthful decisions. And, and with the goal being to move towards optimal health. Do you feel the government and the medical professions are pushing this hard enough? In some ways, yes. Uh, the government sponsors uh, uh, monies to help promote health maintenance organizations, HMOs. Uh, 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 Iowa is in the process of looking into that, that particular uh, approach. The health maintenance organization is uh, an insurance. It's a third party payment kind of program where individuals are uh, health educated and are provided with uh, health maintenance versus sickness uh, care. Uh, on the other hand, the sickness system. Um, more has to be done. More work is being done on, uh, on the industrial level and at the government level uh, presently. Let's get into a few specifics. I know you have a lot of experience with uh, heart attacks and heart attack prevention. What can be done to prevent a heart attack? First off, who is a candidate for a heart attack? Anyone's a candidate for a heart attack. Uh, it boils down to lifestyles, lifestyle behaviors, and uh, as has been said again, the risk factors, the risk factors in one's lifestyles. For example, smoking, uh, serum cholesterol levels, uh, and high blood pressure are the top three risk factors for having a heart attack. And anyone can have those uh, risk factors. Uh, college students, uh, young people, old people. Uh, age is a significant risk factor. It does increase your risk as you get older. Those, uh, the combined uh, uh, risk factors become more uh, uh, substantial. Anybody can have a heart attack. Though. Men and women equally susceptible? Men have a, a, a greater risk of having a heart attack uh, at this time. It's changing, though. Uh, as women go uh, get into the workforce and uh, as women change their lifestyles, they are increasing their risk of having heart attacks. It's really, bo it boils down to uh, how we behave, how we feel about ourselves. It boils down to uh, interrelationship of physical health, mental health, spiritual health. Uh, and that's, those are the kind of things that uh, interrelate to uh, increase our risk or decrease our risk of having a heart attack. So if we were going to decrease our risk of having a heart attack, you think we would have to not just focus on one particular area like blood pressure, uh, although it may be important. We have to look at the, the, our whole concept, our whole self, our whole health. We have to look at our lifestyle. Again, that critical word in, in a wellness program is lifestyle or analyzing our life, lifestyles. Uh, and we can do that by looking at our behaviors, how we behave, what we do, the dynamics of our lifestyle what happens to us and how we feel about all those things. Uh, yes, it's going to require a whole a variety of uh, changing uh, changes that we have to make if we want to reduce our risk or increase our, our uh, wellness towards the optimal health end of the continuum. Um, for example, dealing with smoking. Uh, it's not just dealing with the, the uh, smoking, it's why do we smoke, when do we smoke, how do we smoke, and how do we feel about smoking, and is it a very important part of our life. There's a whole uh, bunch of dynamics that go along with smoking, and uh, a bunch of dynamics that go along with uh, uh, serum cholesterol, what we eat, uh, not just the eggs and, and the shellfish, it's also the fat content of, of our foods. Why we eat that? Uh, is it because our parents ate it? Uh, is it because we're close, we live n next door to a fast food restaurant? Uh, it's a whole bunch of dynamics that uh, make up our lifestyle and uh, increase our risk or lower our risk of uh, diseases. Another word we hear very often these days is stress. Is all stress bad for us? No. No, there's positive stress and, and negative stress. Uh, exercise is a stress. Uh, to get the effect of exercise, to get the positive effect of exercise, you really have to stress your body. And uh, then again, too much negative stress is uh, not so good. 
Uh, stress is uh, interrelated with cholesterol. Uh, you, while you're under, if you're under stress, your cholesterol levels go up. Uh, it's related, of course, to blood pressure. We smoke on, uh, because of stress in some cases. We overeat because of some stresses, because of poor problem-solving uh, uh, techniques. Uh, it's interrelated with a variety of, of factors. Uh, it's, it's a very important uh, uh, risk factor. It's a very important thing uh, in terms of the wellness revolution. Uh, learning how to relax, learning how to positively deal with stress is very, very important. Uh, learning how to breathe, a respiration, which comes from the word spirit, respiration. Uh, is a very important phenomena that the wellness uh, uh, movement is looking at very seriously. If we learn how to breathe carefully and deeply, and uh, it reduces stress, it makes us feel good, and that's very important. Is there any way we can harness this stress and use it in a positive way? Or is it best just to deal with it uh, and try to alleviate the stress? You mean? Uh, what do you mean negative? What do you mean harness? Uh, can, do, do, we need, do we need certain types of stress? Uh, maybe an actor or a singer or something get a little bit of stress to make the performance a little bit better. Or in everyday situations, maybe we're confronted with a crisis. Do we need some type of stress to get us through that crisis? A lot of people perform better under stress. Uh, you know, if you're not nervous before you go on stage, you're probably going to flub your lines, as I've been told. Uh, but too much uh, has to be dealt with in a positive way, and that calls for understanding your body and getting in touch with breathing and, and uh, breathing exercises, etc. Um, getting back to exercise, exercise is a stress we can harness and, and a, uh, a stress that can result in positive effect, uh, benefits, positive effects. Um, and you must stress yourself to get the positive effects, so there's an example of positive stress that can be harnessed to benefit our body and our spirit and mind. What about exercise as it relates to staying healthy and feeling good? Do we all have to run 10, 20 miles a day or uh, how do we know how much exercise that we need individually? It depends on a variety of factors. Uh, exercise is important and I am pretty a little leery using the word exercise. I always like to say activity in keeping moving, constantly, not just sitting there and constantly watching TV and just moving your body one way or another, whether it's dance, whether it's uh, uh, running, swimming, bicycling, anything that gets your heart under stress and gets your, gets your blood flowing is the kind of uh, activity and, and it's different for different individuals. Uh, but it's very important. It's very important. For example, uh, many authority will, uh, authorities will agree that weight control programs will not succeed without some sort of activity program. Uh, the idea that activity uh, results in positive self-image, it makes you feel good, um, it also burns up calories. And it's, very, it's a very important integral part of a weight control program, as an example. The two things we always hear about when we're talking about our health, smoking and drinking, bad for us. Well, some studies show that uh, uh, moderate drinking is good for you. Uh, a couple of studies have shown that uh, one to two drinks a day, one and a half drinks a day, reduces your risk of having a heart attack. Uh, smoking definitely increases your risk of having a heart attack. It's the carbon monoxide, not only the TARS and, and the drug nicotine, it's the carbon monoxide which increases your risk. Uh, it strangles your uh, circula circulatory system. Uh, it's a certain, and also contributes to cholesterol levels uh, increasing. It also contributes to blood pressure increasing. Um, it's a significant factor. Uh, I'm an ex-smoker, and I know there are a lot of smokers watching this program, and uh, they're saying, oh, well, it's easy for him to say he doesn't smoke now. And, but it's a very difficult task, and it requires, again, getting back to that, that very important uh, word, lifestyle. Lifestyle. The person has to check out, look at the way he behaves, why he's doing what he's doing. Why are you smoking? Is it the coffee? Is it the uh, meal that's prompting you to smoke? Very important uh, kinds of things to look at, uh, the dynamics of how we live. 
What are some other silent signals that, that we should be aware of uh, relating to our body? Uh, I'm thinking of high blood pressure here. A lot of people have it and don't know about yeah. it. There really is no w clear cut symptom or sign and symptom of uh, high blood pressure, hypertension. Uh, that is where the doctor uh, becomes a very important part of the health team. The doctor or the nurse can check out your blood pressure. Uh, that really is w the only way to uh, discover if you have high blood pressure. Uh, signs and symptoms, for example, stress, butterflies in your stomach, uh, uh, heavy breathing, you find yourself sweating, cold, clammy uh, hands, too much stress, something to think about. Uh, let me ask you something. Uh, what, how are we doing with our kids and trying to bring them up to be healthy individuals? Uh, uh, what, what can we do to promote uh, a healthier attitude or a better attitude toward health among our children? It boils down to the way we behave. Uh, it boils down to modeling how we behave. For example, uh, if we are drug users, and many of us are, in terms of just taking an aspirin when we have a headache, or taking an aspirin every time we have a headache, uh, we'll teach our children how to behave when we're under stress or when we have a, heart, uh, a, a headache. Uh, it also increases the chance of becoming uh, drug users themselves, maybe other drugs. So modeling is a very, very important uh, concept in terms of teaching our children. Uh, that's just one example, I guess. So if, would, you, would you agree that if we try to improve our lifestyles, try to stay healthier, that is one way to bring the cost of, of health care down and try to stay out of the doctor's office quite as much? Absolutely. Absolutely. Taking responsibility, also shopping around and becoming an active consumer of that medical care system, asking questions of your doctor, asking questions at the clinic or the hospital, uh, uh, also taking some responsibility for ourselves. Uh, uh, and understanding that, uh, for example, uh, there is no cure for the common cold. Going to the doctor may not result in a, in a cure. It may result in, you know, some help in, in other ways. Um, Patient heal thyself, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, or keep part, yourself healthy. It's partly the responsibility of the uh, patient, certainly. Okay, Michael Pasak from uh, Iowa State University. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. And that is our report for this special uh, report. Thank you for joining us.